<clears throat> actually quite incredible. I'm constantly surprised by what we find in the collections, and I wanted to give you a few examples of that. Um, just last week, for instance, uh, you see here a, uh, a collection of 15 different silly foams from the 1960s. We also have, uh, so I saw something that I didn't think I would ever see in my life, which is the uh, Discovery shuttle uh, actually being flown and delivered to the Smithsonian, uh, piggyback style on top of a 747 jet. You'd think that it would be able to fly there itself, but uh, you know, what do I know? Um, a, uh, we also have smaller objects. So for instance, we have a collection of 45,000 bee specimens, and we have American icons like Miss Piggy, who just recently this year joined uh, Kermit the Frog in, in the collection. And one question that I often get, uh, thanks to Ben Stiller, is does the museum come to life at night? At night? Uh, and I can happily report that indeed it does. Uh, the zoo is full of animals that keep very odd hours, such as this uh, naked mole rat. Uh, but we also have uh, cute animals as well, so uh, don't worry about that when you, when you come. Uh, so you might wonder why I'm spouting off you know, all these different examples of items in the, a, a collection that is exactly 2,404 miles away. And the reason is that the Smithsonian keeps our 176 million objects and specimens in the collection in trust. In trust for you, in trust for the aspiring teachers that you work with, and for uh, their students. Yet, how are you supposed to get to it? Uh, there are uh, a couple options. You can walk 788 hours, you can drive 36 hours, or you can fly four and a half hours. None of those seem like very good options to me. But there's a second option, is of course to be instantly transported to the museum via the internet. And the Institution's Digitization Program Office has been working incredibly hard to ensure this option, to democratize the collection, because even if you were to visit, less than 2% of the collection is on display. Traditionally, photography has been the method of digitization at, at the Smithsonian and in museums in general. And today, rapid capture projects have allowed us to be able to capture 2D imagery of thousands of objects per day and put them online. Um, and we have, uh, we are able to do this with objects such as uh, the gold nugget. And I'm not talking about the casino across the street, of course. We're looking at, uh, this is the gold nugget that started the gold rush to California. So I'm curious, how big do you think it is? Yeah, fist size, and you know, and you know what? I think like this is the gold nugget. It started the the gold rush to California. It's got to be the size of your head. But you know, the reason I like to use this as an example is because it illuminates some of the challenges of 2D imagery. So this is an, it on a fingertip. It's smaller than the quarter size of a, a postage stamp. So. You know, we have some issues with 2D imagery, and that is uh, scale. Unless you know what you're looking at, it's very difficult to tell how big it is. And also, you can't have any control perspective. Uh, you don't see that it's actually very flat. <laughs> uh, you can't see the back of it, and that is even more challenging for other types of objects. So to solve this challenge, the institution has leveraged technology from a number of different industries. The movie industry, uh, engineering, and the medical industry, uh, we've borrowed a 3D technology and applied it to the museum setting. And I want to show you a, a video so that you can get a sense of what that looks like. button is much smaller than the gold nugget right on this computer. so we can get the full button on it. Oops. And I think it's very interesting to understand the camera angle and the view that you're providing to us is extensive to about 6 feet. Not only are we looking at the very large camera, 
across generations. Whether it was a cave painting or pebbles left in a particular order to give direction, we have tried to communicate with others to leave a record of what was. Recently, we've developed more sophisticated tools, whether they're telescopes to look at the stars or electron microscopes to look at scales almost invisible to the naked eye. If you think about the way that uh, humans just perceive the world, um, we see in stereographic vision, we perceive depth. Um, so 3D scanning offers us sort of a natural way to capture and interpret the world around us. Now that we have embarked upon using it in ways that are meaningful, the audience is the world. simplest terms is measurement. Um, instead of point-to-point -point measurement like you do with a tape measure or with a pair of calipers, we're taking thousands, millions, or billions of measurements that describe the geometry of an object. 3D technology really affords us the opportunity to see an object from all angles, to tell the entire story of an object, front, back, bottom, top. You can create still renders from that uh, 3D model. You can create video renders. You can even take the geometry and replicate it in physical form using 3D printing technologies or other rapid manufacturing techniques. We've scanned things as small as a euglossine bead using micro CT scanning technology. Um, and we've also scanned entire archeological sites in Chile, Indonesia. You can also use X-ray telescopes that can document objects in deep space at an incredibly vast cosmic scale. Of course, most of the Smithsonian collection lies somewhere in between, and that's what we do most of the time. But 3D technology can be defined very broadly, and what you can capture um, surprises us all the time. We want to make sure that any technology we bring in is in service of our mission. So what we've done is we've partnered up with our curators, with researchers, with educators, with conservators, and we've put that technology at their service and we've said, how does this actually further your day-to-day -day work? And we've created an amazing array of use cases that actually showcase that in all these areas, 3D makes a tremendous impact and can allow people to do more of the things they're already striving to do. We're seeing 3D impacting many different areas of the museum world, whether that be exhibits, research, conservation. 3D right now is enabling us to travel objects in a safer way. Um, we're providing educators with new access tools using our 3D viewer, and we're supporting research by providing very accurate measurable data um, to Smithsonian scientists. 3D is a game changer for museums. I think being able to connect to 3D representations of objects helps us share outside of our walls, outside of Washington, outside of the East Coast, outside of the U.S., to everyone, everywhere. In the instance of the Cosmic Buddha that I'm working on right now, it's really helping me at this kind of uh, surface level. You're seeing much more than you could ever see uh, yourself. 3D is much less intrusive than other methods that we've used in the past because you don't actually have to manipulate and touch and hold the object. This allows us to get static objects or even whole field sites scanned, documented, archived. It's all about capturing that moment in research time. One of the things that really fuels our work is, is the people that we work with. They all bring new ideas to the table every day and we get to help their vision come to life. These are some of the core functions of the Smithsonian and we can already see how those might undergo a very profound change given this new technology. Oh my gosh, 3D technology. It will help us in ways we don't even understand yet. It seems like every day, every week, we get a call about a new type of project that explores new possibilities and unlocks new potential. And we're super excited about what we'll be able to do with it as the technology develops in three years and five years in 10 years. We've just scratched the surface in applications of 3D technologies. It's about learning what this, this new type of data means to the world, not just telling the world what it means. People will come up with great ideas, they will share them in their social media, and then other people will build on those ideas. The more we can see, the more we can know, the better questions we can ask and answer, and the more things we can solve. How do we scale this up 
so we can not just do a dozen, so we can do hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of objects in a meaningful period of time. We need partners to help us do this. People will have an expectation of seeing objects in 3D. It will be ubiquitous. Everyone will know that this is a technology that they can use and use effectively. That's incredibly exciting and that's going to change the way museums work. That's going to change the way researchers do their research and it's going to change the way that educators can deliver uh, content to the world. Now, there's a long road ahead before 3D digitization is at a point where we can create 3D models quickly. And I'm excited to be here today because we are so early in the process. You're pedagogical experts with a vast array of content area backgrounds. And I'd like to be able to appeal to your expertise to discover how we not only use 3D digitization to democratize access to the collections, but to use 3D objects to bring powerful learning experiences to life. Uh, and this is for students and also in teacher education. I began thinking about this issue uh, through an ebook that we were working on, this activity based for classrooms. It's called The Mind Behind the Mask, 3D Technology and the Portrayal of Abraham Lincoln. Fingers crossed it should be launching in April, but in this process, I learned that it's easy to get excited about a new technology, but along the way, I had to con constantly pinch myself uh, to ensure that the technology was supporting the learning and, and not the other way around. And with this shared understanding, the Smithsonian, the Laboratory School for Advanced Manufacturing Technologies, and Princeton University has started a new project. Using inventions from our collection, our goal is to help students learn concretely about how problems were solved in the past, how solutions have evolved over time, and in doing so, help provide students with interdisciplinary skills they need to help solve the problems of the future. This, of course, isn't a completely new idea. For instance, an inquisitive Wilbur Wright wrote to the Smithsonian in 1899. He said, I have been interested in the problem of flight, of mechanical and human flight, ever since as a boy, I constructed a number of bats of various sizes after the style of Calais and Panaz machines. I am an enthusiast, but not a crank, in the sense that I have some pet theories as to the proper construction of a flying machine. I wish to avail myself of all that is known and then, if possible, add my might to help the future worker who will attain final success. The Wright brothers were enabled by their early experiences reconstructing early inventions. They grew up in an environment that encouraged them to investigate, to design, and construct. And looking back, what his brother said that they had special advantages. Today, thanks to the Smithsonian's work in 3D digitization, the laboratory schools work for the use of advanced manufacturing technologies in uh, K-12 classrooms, and Princeton University's pioneering of inventions-based engineering curriculum in formal education, you were in a better position than ever to help make an experience like this possible for K-12 education. And we propose that this is a solution to a very important problem. When it comes to understanding technology, we have a, a, a black box problem. You know, everything is, you know, encased and it's very difficult to understand what's going on. It's complex and opaque. Yet the predecessors that form the foundation of these technologies that surround us today are rooted in very simple ideas. And we have them, many of them, in the collection at the Smithsonian. And the story of these inventions and discoveries offers us a learning path that facilitates understanding. Now, we start the story in 1800 with the invention of a, a battery uh, which could provide electricity to a circuit. And over the course of 100 years, uh, we see the electromagnet come up, the telegraph, the motor, the electric motor, the telephone, and the light bulb. Soon after, a long distance electric grid becomes feasible. And by the end of the century, people's lives have completely changed. The inventions behind this story are simple and transparent, yet they're great engineering. They can be readily deconstructed and understood through the process of reverse engineering. And in a proof of concept with middle school students uh, at the lab school, they designed and fabricated a working reinterpretation of the Morse, mail, Morse Vale telegraph uh, key and relay and the page motor. They even were able to run a line between 
uh, their middle school and elementary school across the street and, and send some messages back and forth. And today for the first time, I'm, we're going to be unveiling uh, the first 3D scan of an invention uh, from the Smithsonian for this project. <laughs> we'll give it a second to load. So this is the Page Motor. It was created by Charles Page, a man who was interested in the idea of being able to do work with electricity. It's located in the Smithsonian X3D Explorer, where we have tour functionality that will allow us to take students through this invention to really show them how it functions. It also has storytelling functionality to allow us to show some important primary sources as well, such as the patent that Paige filed. We're also able to create animations so that students can see how the invention worked. We we're also able to build a CAD model so that not only are you able to look at the outside geometry of the object, be able to see it working through an animation, but also be able to take cross sections so you can see it on the inside to see the interior components that make it function. While it's loading, I can also tell you a little bit about how we're able to create models like this. So we use laser scanning technology, which is actually quite interesting because essentially how it works is you have a, a laser scanner that emits uh, a laser onto an object. And the laser light bounces back. So imagine if you are looking in a mirror and shine a light in it, the light bounces right back. Um, this is exactly how a laser scanner works, except the laser scanner has se sensors built into it so it can figure out exactly how long it takes for that laser to hit the object and reflect back. And that measurement uh, equates to a, a, an amount of time that it, that took to happen, which in turn is able to turn into an XYZ coordinate because the object, uh, the, the scanner knows where it is in position to the object. So once you have millions of XYZ coordinates you build the geometry of the object. All right, 
let's just hop in and take a cross section ourselves. So you can kind of see how the, the coils here, when we put the model up yesterday, so we'll make a few tweaks on it, but uh, you'll be able to see the, the coiling on, of the wires and the electromagnets. You'll be able to see the screws that go in the base. You'll be able to see where the wires come up and into the object uh, through it to uh, power the coils as well. So now that you've seen the, the page motor, we'd like to give you a sneak peek at what the invention kits look like. The American Innovations in an Age of Discovery initiative is a partnership between the Smithsonian Institution and the Laboratory School for Advanced Manufacturing. The Laboratory School for Advanced Manufacturing consists of two middle school sites in the Charlottesville and Albemarle school systems. The Lab School and the Smithsonian are jointly developing historical reconstruction invention kits. The invention kits are online collections of resources to stimulate interest and foster understanding and imagination about inventions that made a difference in our society. These kits focus on historical artifacts that can be easily understood, have broad applications, and are influential. These are objects that have shaped the modern world. These materials draw broadly from many areas, including biography, natural science, physics, chemistry, materials, engineering, social science, economics, politics, sociology, history, and the humanities, arts and culture. How do inventions work? What are they good for? How has society been affected by them? Who were the inventors? What motivated them? What new inventions based on the same ideas might follow? What is the difference between discovery and design? How have inventions influenced the works of artists, scholars, and writers? These are some of the questions and ideas addressed by our materials and activities. The opportunity to take some of the engineering um, and add it into our physical science to uh, create maker spaces and our kids to look at products uh, make the product, do a lesson, make the product, and then actually get working models out of it. It's kids now need to, to be able to put things together, to see how things work. We, we got away from that for years, and so kids don't do that anymore. And so to see our kids fascinated to come into school and want to be a part of making things and see how it works, it's really wonderful. Groups of students from Buford Middle School and Sutherland Middle School have participated in preliminary testing of three invention kits over the past year. These kits include the telegraph, the Charles Page electromagnetic engine, and the battery. Development is also in progress for the telephone and the galvanometer. Students explore the history of and science behind each invention and then participate in scaffolded activities to reconstruct and reinterpret the original inventions using 2D and 3D fabrication tools. The goal is not an exact physical replica, but a reinterpretation of the device using modern manufacturing technology. The original artifacts are inspiration for the students' own designs, allowing them to create a product that is uniquely their own. The piece that I really didn't, didn't know was going to come is the failing. When the kids fail or something, um, it's not over. Yeah, John, you got something coming up. <laughs> it's not over until they say it's over. So being able to get back on the horse and try it again and try something different than what you tried. 
and seeing the success when a kid has failed at something two or three times, then all of a sudden you get it and that aha goes off. That's your wish. My wish is that every school in America can have a program like this. This type of collaborative reinvention is the point of the American Innovations in an Age of Discovery project. To encourage the interleaving of engineering and scientific thinking as students approach inventions of the past and consider how those inventions influence their time period and echo in ours today. The first invention kit, unveiled nationally for the first time today, is Charles Grafton Page's solenoid electric motor. This prototype invention kit can now be accessed through the educational section of the Smithsonian X3D website. I'm extremely pleased to say that Rick and Eric, the two principals at the lab schools in the, the video, are in the audience today. Uh, they came to Las Vegas so that they could answer your questions and be able to get input as pedagogical experts. Uh, Rick, Eric, can you uh, stand up or raise your hand for us? Thank you again for coming today. Now, as Eric alluded to, we want to be able to bring these invention kits to everybody. We'll be putting them online for free in the Smithsonian X3D website, and each invention kit will be scaffolded such that students will be able to create the inventions with hand tools that were available at, during the time period, as well as more advanced manufacturing technologies ranging from inexpensive die cutters to 3D printers to laser cutters. It's very important for us that students be able to do this uh, you know, where they are and that we can meet them there and then eventually as they're able to get additional resources or if not uh, be able to reconstruct inventions uh, regardless of what they have available. Two students who participated in the telegraph pilot thought that scientists knew everything. Now, it fascinated them as they were constructing the Vailmore Telegraph and reading the original journals from Vail that they ran into some of the very same problems that he did. It was able to help them really get over this idea that scientists are these you know, people who know everything and that it's, there's no grit required in recreating inventions uh, or in you know, creating something new. The science and engineering teachers at the lab schools were able to work together and enable the students to solve these challenges. And as a result, both disciplines were enhanced. It was, after all, scientific knowledge that added fuel to the fire of invention during this time period. And this relationship makes invention a natural way to facilitate the next generation science standards call for increased integration of engineering and science teaching. Additionally, because technology and society are so closely intertwined, inventions are natural connections to the social studies. To discuss these possibilities, uh, let's hear from David Slykeis and then John Lee. Thank you, Matt. All right, so a good question is, you know, how do we take these really cool inventions and how do we place those really within the science context and what we are doing. So if you think about right now, we recently come out in the last two years of these next generation science standards. The next generation science standards have worked to infuse this idea of engineering into the science curriculum. And this really provides this opportunity to weave some of these experiences into science understanding to give students a, a deeper understanding of where these things came from, how it works, and what happens. So the trick is, how do you put the science standards together with you know, Charles Page and this engine? How do, you, how do you find those two things to fit together? Well, it turns out that it works pretty well. Uh, so there's a picture of, of Charles Page, and he was the one that came up with this uh, electromagnetic engine. And he, the time period that he was living at was really right at the birth of what we would consider sort of our own modern society, because this is right after the invention of the battery. This was in, within about you know, 20 to 30 years of the battery being discovered, being able to put electricity flowing through a wire, figuring out that if you set a compass on top of that wire, you get deflection. All of these things are happening in rapid fire succession. We're learning all about electricity and magnetism, and suddenly finding out that electricity and magnetism interact. 
and, and how these things fit together. So this is, this is a time where these discoveries and these inventions that they are being made right now, as Matt said, the, the, the actual things that they're creating are just out in the open. You know, if someone was making an engine today, making an electromechanical engine today, one of the first things that they would worry about is what is the cover and the box and the aesthetic going to look like when they try to make the invention. At this point, they were making them, everything's out in the open, there is no black box, and you can see exactly how everything works. And so you can see here on this slide some pictures in the background of some of these recreations of the Charles Page uh, motor and how this works. And so I want to show you, see if I can do this here, show you a close-up of one of these, because I brought one with me as well. Oh, that froze. That's not what I want. This is what happens when we have to use someone else's computer. Where did this? I want this. I want my. No, I want a new frame recording. Or a new. All right. There we go. Okay. So here is the motor. See if I can I can get this on screen here a little bit. All right, so this is an example of the, of the recreation, and you can see it's a pretty cool device. It looks relatively simple, but there are some real subtleties uh, of what's going on in here and how this really works. So really what you have here are just two solenoids, two coils of wire that are wrapped. You run electricity through those. You, as the electricity goes through there, it creates a magnetic field. The magnetic field pulls that bar that you see there pulls it in to that side, and, you, and the bar goes in. And then, if you're really careful about what you do, you switch the electricity now to this coil on this side, and the bar gets pulled over here on this side, and it goes back and forth. Now, it's relatively easy to do. You can just you know, hook electricity up here, hook electricity up here, but to really make it a motor, you have to find a way to switch that electricity quickly back and forth, and that's where you come over here to this switch in here. And as, as this rotates, can you hold that? Thank you. All right, so as, as this rotates here, it, it makes a connection on one side, which will activate the, one of the coils. It rotates around, it makes a, a connection on the other side, it rotates the other coil, and now you get it and it'll spin. Now, I created this one uh, earlier this fall at the NTLS, we made these uh, in Washington, D.C. This one didn't survive the flight quite so well, so I'm not going to hook it up for you uh, and make it run. But it, it does work. It did work. Um, and it's, it's very cool. Now, you can also take these things a step further, as we've talked about. And once you understand the basic engineering that's behind this, the basic idea of of the solenoids and making them work and getting them to switch back and forth. And now you can start to reconfigure them. And if you are an engineer at Princeton, like Michael Littman is, then you come up with something that is a little bit different. John, could you hold this again? So this is basically the exact same idea. 
How are we doing there? Okay. This is basically the same idea. Two solenoids, again, you have metal coils there, and turn one solenoid on and the other, it goes up and down. But you notice that this one has been reconfigured into a vertical alignment. That bridges across the humanities into science and technology, engineering and math. Abraham Lincoln was a tinkerer, as we all know, the only president to hold a patent, an inventor. Uh, he saw things that other people didn't see, which is what made him so great. And one of the things that he saw was the potential of the telegraph that had just been created in his adult life. It was not widely adopted. Uh, really, the only users of the telegraph, other than the scientists that were working on it in the 1850s, were the financial industry, um, exchanging in information that would give them an advantage in selling uh, equities. Lincoln saw the value in it and uh, began to actively use the telegraph as a war president um, and used it to his advantage in managing the war. And so, you know, what happens here is we have this really interesting intersection of history and science and technology. And so that has uh, provided me with a context to kind of move into this project and to think about the ways that we can use primary sources and students' inquiry, their engagement with those sources, um, that results from their inquiry in on uh, about questions that are compelling and have an interesting nature to them on topics that are being worked on in these invention kits. Okay, so we're in the process of developing those and we might have, let's see, back out. So we're in the process of developing those and I have a few questions that I want to pose to you. These are sample questions that we're thinking about. So the idea here is that when we develop an inquiry, we begin with a question in our C3 framework standards document, whoops, not standards, framework document, uh, what we say is that inquiry begins with a compelling question. Compelling questions have a, a kind of a two-part characteristic to it. They are relevant, so that means they're interesting to students. Students can see something that is of value to them in it. They can recognize themselves in the question. And the questions are rigorous. So that means people that are in the academic disciplines would recognize the question as well. It turns out that's really hard to do, to write a question that is relevant to children and is rigorous. It's recognizable to a 12-year-old and it's recognizable to a historian or to a scientist. Here's some of the questions that we've come up with so far. I just want to give these to you to see what you think of them. And these would be questions that would drive an inquiry that would last three to five weeks that would involve students engaging historical sources for the purpose of building up the knowledge that they need to make claims supported with evidence from those sources in an argument. Ultimately, this is a writing assignment, so the final product is for students to write their argument, but we recognize also that there would need to be adaptations of those arguments so that students learn the skills that they need to communicate in multiple uh, modalities. So here's some of the questions. Is all innovation good? Okay, another one. What are the costs of innovation? Another one, what is the trajectory of innovation? And that kind of draws on uh, Matt's idea of a trajectory across these various innovations. Are we at the end of the age of discovery? It's kind of a pushy question, a little bit obnoxious. Kids like that, and it might be reasonable um, to ask a question like that. Another one, what's so disruptive about technology and innovation? And then our last one that we're playing around with right now is what makes an invention an innovation? We kind of like that one. So we're going to pick one of these. If there's one that you like and you think we ought to do, tap me on the shoulder and tell me. We're going to build out a full inquiry, and then we're going to make that, uh, inquiries, or those inquiries available to the teachers that are using the innovation kits so that they can stage this work with their students across all the disciplines in the school and, and have one of those... Uh, um, one of those interdisciplinary experiences that, that we want our students to have. So thank you very much for involving me in this project. I'm gonna turn it back over to Matt to, to conclude. We're excited about the possibilities of the invention kits and have had some initial successes. Two of the very first students who worked on the Telegraph said that they feel like modern Alfred Vales or Samuel Morris's. Struggling to create an electromagnetic magnetic engine, another group of students said they feel like the successor is to Charles Page. It's clear to us that the students who will solve the problems of tomorrow are out there, and we hope to reach them to support them. But today, I'm excited to be able to reach you, 
and we truly hold the collection at the Smithsonian in trust for you, and we're always looking to find new ways to get it out and use it in meaningful ways. You're experts in your field, and with your help, we have high hopes for this project and projects in the future. Rick, Glenn, and I, uh, as well as David and John, would uh, look forward to talking to you uh, to hear your ideas and inputs for this project as well as others. And thank you very much for your time. <laughs>